And uh, now we move on to uh, Medieval. Uh, medieval evidence. So Matthew uh, Morris is one of our um, project officers. We'll be talking about recreating Grey Friars. A token trip into the medieval period for today. And inevitably, with the ULAS project, we've got to mention Richard III at least once. It's a <laughs> but whilst I was drawing you in by saying the burial place of Richard III, this is all about the Grey Friars itself, he says, as he starts with Richard III. Um, the Richard III story in Leicester has actually produced been a good source of inspiration for reconstruction artists all the way back to the 18th century, as it turns out. So here we've got the antiquary Francis Peck's drawing from 1730 of the Bow Bridges in Leicester, showing Richard's body in a very tiny detail on it being brought back over the bridge. It was a source of romantic inspiration in the um, late 19th and early 20th century as well, particularly with Richard's um, association with the Blue Boar Inn in Leicester. And more recently, we've used it as a, a source of inspiration for how we show what the interior of Leicester Castle's Great Hall would have looked like. And so here, Richard III is having a feast in the hall, just as a way of um, giving the scene a more dynamic, a dynamic um, atmosphere, effectively. And you can see this one, the original artworks upstairs at the minute. What all of these drawings have in common, though, is whilst we are using Richard III here, they are all attempts to reconstruct structures that are either no longer standing in Leicester, like the Bow Bridge and the Blue Boar Inn, or are no longer visible in the form that you see in this drawing, like the Great Hall. This structure still exists, but it's buried between all of the modern walls that now divide the space up. And so, whilst he's a good drawer, these are all trying to reconstruct something from evidence-based um, excavation material, effectively. And that's true of the Greyfriars as well, and particularly true because, of course, the Greyfriars has nothing visible above ground today. So the only way we can actually envision the space Richard III was buried in is to have an attempt to reconstruct it. But we do have to remember, reconstructions can take many forms. They can be narratives, they can be physical reconstructions, artwork, reenactment, dramatizations, poetry, all sorts of um, avenues that you can use to reconstruct the past and tell those stories. But whilst they are evidence-led, they are always pictures of probability and possibility. And so there is, therefore, the chance we get it wrong. And you do, when looking at reconstruction art, uh, have to remember that it is true as of the moment it was created, using the evidence available at the point it was created, and sometimes thinking moves on. I mean, a lot of the Mike Cod drawings of Leicester that you see and we use widely, a lot of those have got errors in them now because we know from new discoveries that things have changed. The, the big view of Roman Leicester does not have the theatre that Gavin's just talked about in it, for instance, because we hadn't found it at that point. And to give you an example of that, this was one of the very earliest reconstructions from the Greyfriars work we did. We needed something in the run-up to the press conference where we announced it was Richard III. We needed something visual for people to understand the space that he was being buried in. And this bit of artwork by Jill Atherton was using the evidence we had at the time of the 2012 excavation, the original excavation, to reconstruct the chancel of the Greyfriars Church. And the evidence was leading us to think it was perhaps a 15th or early 16th century brick rebuild, which would be quite unusual. And that's what you see in this drawing. And you've likely never seen this drawing again because it's a load of rubbish. <laughs> this is where evidence can change. So during the excavation, the original excavation, we'd found what seemed to be a large pile of 15th century perpendicular architecture on the floor of the church in the primary demolition layer. And there was brick dust and brick staining on it, and that's what led us to suggest that there was this late medieval rebuild of the church. 
It also seemed to fit into this engraving of a lost illumination from John Nichols' work, supposedly representing the Grey Friars in Leicester. And you seem to have some similarities there in some of the architectural details that this bit of building was showing. And so that then leads to this drawing being created, a reconstruction of the window. And it is an accurate reconstruction of the window. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the, the context of the window is wrong. What we realized going back in 2013 and looking at a bigger excavation and delving into the historic archives is that that is a 19th century Victorian ripoff of a medieval window that had been thrown away in a sewage trench that had cut through the floor of the Greyfriars Church. And we just caught the edge of it in the 2012 excavation, and it looked completely plausible. When we went back and we investigated the area in 2013, we realized the error we had made. And, well, those windows don't exist anymore. That's where the other bit of the Richard III Visitor Center is. So when that new extension was built and took out that bay window, all of that rubble has been thrown in the back of the sewage trench that has been dug down the side of the new building. And so, yeah, looked convincing at the time, but completely wrong, and led us down the wrong avenue of reconstruction, effectively. So... Like Gavin's talked about already, we've then got to get from excavation data to reconstruction. We've got to get from this scene of us excavating in 2013 to something looking like this. So how do we do that? Well, for the first instance, of course, we've got all of that surviving architectural detail and plan in the ground that we can actually look at. We've got surviving wall lines, we've got furniture within the building space, we can start identifying specific areas of the building as well. So this is a view of the uh, effectively a cross section across the chancel of the church. Whilst the walls themselves aren't surviving, we can still see their foundation trenches. And inside you've got all of that extensive area of fragmentary floor surfaces still surviving, or at least the beddings for the tile floors. So you can see the, the tile impressions on the, on the right here. And then set within those floor areas, you've got other areas of stone work that we can start working out as architectural arrangements within the building space. So in this instance, what you're looking at here is this fragment of stonework running parallel with the building's wall is the base of the choir stool. And then the line of slates going across at right angles across the space, that actually represents a step up in floors from one space to the other. And that's representing the step up from the choir of the church into the sanctuary of the church where the altar would be. So we can start drawing all of these bits of evidence together, plotting them out and getting the scale correct. And therefore, we can start actually placing the friary and its different areas within the landscape of the town. And... With all of those little architectural clues, so sort of stone benching marking where the chapter house used to be, whilst the walls aren't surviving, we can still trace where the wall junctions are from quarried out wall footings. We've got things like the, choir, um, the stone footings for the choir stools. We can start plotting the known information. So everything you see on this plan, that is the known information about the friary. And it's not a lot, but we haven't done a huge amount of excavation. We've only done, in 2012, those three blue trenched areas. Those are all sort of 30 metres long and two metres wide. And then that bigger red area, that was the follow-up excavation, which is where the shop area of the Richard III Centre is today. So that was sort of to link it all together and the archaeology done before they built that extension. So it's a bit of a join-the-dots exercise in some ways because we are so limited with our evidence. But we are lucky in that friaries do follow generally a reasonably conventional floor plan. And so we do have other options. And here's another reconstruction of that known evidence by Joe Atherton from early on. And again, even here, things have moved on a little bit. Um, well, you can perhaps ignore the, the red color as brick up here and just pretend that's stone now, that's fine. Um, but we do know, for instance, the, the floor pattern here is incorrect based on follow-up excavations in the area. So again, this was a bit of artwork carried out and um, done before the second excavation, so between the two phases of excavation, before we'd actually excavated the full area of the choir. But of course, because it is a Christian um, foundation like a, a monastery, it does have fairly conventional floor plans. And you start seeing similarities across sites. So two 
particularly well examined examples of other Franciscan friaries in Britain. You've got Walsingham in Norfolk on the left and Carmarthen in Wales on the right. And you start seeing certain trends appearing. You can see both of them are double, double cloistered, for instance, a great cloister and a little cloister. Um, Carmarthen has a, a nave with only a north aisle on it, for instance. Both of them have a chancel that is broadly the same length as the nave of, as well. And when you look at the Carmarthen example, the choir footings here are very comparable with what we have at our, our friary as well. So we can start using these comparable sites to fill in and suggest an outline for our friary. So we can therefore go from this plan of known to this speculative plan of the layout. So here we're suggesting that maybe the chancel is double the length of the choir, because that seems to be fairly consistent on Franciscan friary plans, and we're suggesting the nave is the same length as the chancel of the building, because again, that seems to be a common trait. We also don't think physically a south aisle could exist in the building the way it's laid out, and we have documentary evidence for a north aisle. And I'm actually starting to think perhaps I should suggest the North Isle is wider than this because in Leicester there's quite a common trend for uh, a very wide aisles attached to buildings, almost like a double nave. But what I'm being clear at here is where all the unknowns are. This is very speculative, it's a lot of dashed lines and question marks and it isn't going to get any clearer than that because all of those unknown areas are under existing buildings or roads and uh, therefore we're unlikely to actually improve this picture in any way from, from the evidence we've got at the moment. Of course, a lot of those buildings that are on top of it now are listed in their own right and therefore not going anywhere, and the site is now a scheduled ancient monument protecting it as well. We can then start adding texture to that plan. So in some instances, we do have surviving wall fragments. This is a little fragment from the Eastern Cloistral Range. It's about knee height, it's not a particularly great looking wall, but that gives us a clue that the Friary itself was, construction wise, not a particularly great building. It's got no foundation, it is leaning off to the right hand side. It's got plastered walls that have got cracks in it because of the slumping, so clearly at the end of its life this building was in pretty poor condition. We've got a little architectural clue on the right hand side, a doorway, survival of a doorway. And then whilst we haven't got the floors themselves surviving, the, the tile floors have been extensively recycled, you can still see the tile impressions and a few tiles in situ. And we, are, from those impressions, at least see what the pattern of the floor was. So we've got this little straight border along the wall edge itself and then this diagonal arrangement of tiles across the bulk of the floor. And from the demolition material coming out of these floors, we know these tiles are two-toned in colour. So they're glazed, they've got either a sort of blackish brown glaze or they've got a sort of greenish yellow glaze to them. And on the right, you've got a surviving medieval floor from Leicester Abbey. And here you can see it's laid out in the same way with a straight border along the edge and a diagonal pattern. And if you look at the wall edge there where the tiles have not been walked on and the glaze is not walked off, you can see yellow and brownish black and they're in a checker pattern. So it goes yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. So they're being laid out in a checker pattern. So now we can take that information and suggest that might be how the floors in our friary were laid out. And similarly, that, so that's in the domestic buildings um, around the cloister. And then similarly in the church itself, we've got evidence for both the floors in the choir and in the sanctuary of the church. This is the only surviving fragment of in situ floor we found to date from the friary. It's within the choir itself. It's the little bit, if you've been and looked through the grave to, uh, the glass panel to Richard's grave, it's the bit next to the grave. And the stonework at the bottom here, that is the remains of the choir stool itself. So this is up against the choir stool at the very western end of the choir. And again, we can see that two arrangements of tiles, one running parallel or at right angles to the wall, and the other diagonal to the walls. But in this instance, in the church, we're seeing encaustic tiles with decorations, glazed decorations on them, and there's four different tile patterns in this surviving fragment of floor. You've got a fleur-de-lis pattern, this geometric petal motif, and two sort of creatures that, well, I assume the one on the left is meant to be a lion. Who knows what the other one's meant to be? Um, someone who was trying to draw a lion but had a dog with a sheepskin on it, I suspect, there's a model. Um, anyway, uh, 
So we can take that evidence again, and elsewhere again in the choir we have the bedding for the tiles surviving, and within the right light you can get, which well, this photograph was not taken in, but in the right light you can get the impressions of the tiles from the floor, so you can sort of see the, the parallel lines here, but in the get a right enough shadow on it and you actually see something changing and within those parallel lines there's diagonal tiles as well. Step up into the sanctuary of the church and something changes again. You get this much bigger tile impression for a much bigger type of floor tile as well. And taking all of that information together then we can actually reconstruct what the floor of the choir and the sanctuary would have looked like in its final form. We don't know exactly what pattern was on each tile. There's about 23 different tile patterns we've identified from the floor. They all are coming out the choir area, so we assume it's a mixed combination of decorations on the tiles, but this is how they were laid out on the floor itself. From just these little red shaded areas, that's where we've got the evidence. But because it's a repeating pattern, we can suggest that's how it would have covered the whole floor. So you get this very complicated geometric arrangement creating this sort of corridor down the middle of the choir with these board broader sort of bands and blocks of tiles down the sides and it was noticeable where graves had obvious monuments set into the floor, they were all on the sides set into those areas and not down the central space uh, which seems to have been left clear or at least if there was graves there they'd been left unmarked underneath that tile pattern. And of course then we've got that wealth of other material that we've collected during the excavations, we've got pieces of painted stonework, so we're getting an idea of what the walls were decorated with. We've got window tracery surviving, we've got different types of roofing material, we've got roof slates, we've got ceramic tiles, we've got fragments of lead sheeting, we've got documentary references as well during the dissolution to lead from roofs being melted down. We've got evidence of glazed windows from lead window cane. We've got evidence of elaborate tombs within the church because whilst they've been smashed up, some of the brass lettering off them has fallen into the rubble and been left behind as well. We did not get enough to spell Richard. It was very disappointing. <laughs> so we can take all of that evidence and start building it into a model. And in this instance, this is a a more immersive model in that this is a computer generated model that we can rotate round, fly through um, and create a motion film of as well. But again you've got to remember this was created by De Montfort University but it was created in 2014 and again our thinking has moved on along from this a bit now and there are some evidence errors in there as well. So this is so showing you where we've definitely got known evidence, the chancel, the eastern cloistral range, there we've got archaeological evidence for, south range and the west range we've got absolutely no evidence for at all. Nave we've got no physical evidence but we've got some documentary evidence. Tower we've got, we've identified the base of it but we don't know what it would have looked like. Um, North Isle we've got documentary evidence, no physical evidence and so forth. So we can start identifying areas that we need to fill in as well. So with some of this is evidence led, some of it is purely speculative. But of course we've got other medieval churches surviving in Leicester, they're all going to be being built around about the same time as this church by probably many of the same people. So we can start looking to see if there are comparable trends across all of Leicester's churches. We can also look further afield at other surviving friaries and draw inspiration from those surviving fragments as well. The complete range at Coventry Whitefriars, for instance, or the tower at King's Lynn, which is from the Greyfriars at King's Lynn. And we can start bringing all of that together to create that picture of possibility, really. Which leads to something like this. But already, and every time I watch this, I can see an error. <laughs> the chapter house should not have a chimney on it. <laughs> we did not spot it had a chimney on it until they animated the smoke coming out the chimney, <laughs> at which point it was way late, too late to remove the chimney. <laughs> what you see here also, though, as I said, this south range and the west range, just generic. They're based on other friaries. We've got no physical evidence for them at all. Everything else is at least based on archaeological evidence or historical evidence. So the fact we haven't got a south aisle that we can think we can fit in the space, but we've got documentary evidence for a north aisle, so it has a north aisle and no south aisle. 
for the look we've drawn inspiration from other churches in Leicester from the period. But again, as you go in here, this bit under the crossing here, you, that should be a solid wall across. Uh, and we've sort of given it more of an appearance of a parish church than a friary church, which I wish we did go back and, and correct. We have no idea what Richard's tomb looks like. That's just a generic fancy tomb, just to give you a sense of where it is. But even little things like this, again, this was created in 2014 before we'd done a lot of the analysis of the site, including some of the burials. And so we have managed by sheer fluke to misgender every single gravestone you've got there. So, so. <laughs> So all the male knights you see there should be women and vice versa. <laughs> but it now gives us something more understandable, more, more immersive to get to grips with the site. Especially as a visitor to the site today, you are surrounded by 18th and 19th century buildings. It's very hard to appreciate that muddy hole underneath that grass panel as a grave for a king in what was once a massive church. It's really hard to appreciate the fact that the cathedral and St. Martin's and Greyfriars, there was two churches similar sized next to each other through most of the medieval period. So that's led to a new um, reconstruction uh, piece of work that went live this year at the Richard III Centre. So this was being created by Leicester City Museums and Heritage Interactive and an artist called Simon Fleming. And this was trying to get people to a better grounding within the site and how it's changed over time. So this is the view you get when you look out that sort of glass balcony box on the first floor. It's next to where the flying model that we've just watched is as well. And it's always, if you were looking out that way in the medieval period, you'd be seeing the Friary Church. But just looking out of it today, that's really hard to grasp what you would actually be looking at. And with Richard's grave in this bit here, again, quite hard to grasp how the site would have looked. So what this new interactive display has done is it's created a window through time telling, showing six scenes that allows the audience to travel back and forward through six different time points showing what the site would have looked like at key moments in its history. So this is a still from 1612 when it was the gardens of Robert Herrick. But then we can strip it back and have an idea of what it might have looked like during the dissolution itself as it was being demolished. And then right back to when Richard is being buried. And these are actually in the more immersive. They've got sound and rotation to them as well. And you have to go to the Richard III Centre to see the rest, sorry. <laughs> but this is now starting to help, we hope, the audiences, the visitors to the centre start to get that better understanding of why there was a friary there and why there isn't any more and why there is just loads of Victorian and 18th century buildings on the site. Which also allows us a chance to reinvestigate some of the historical and archaeological evidence. So once you've got an, a reconstruction, that's not necessarily the end of it, because sometimes in creating that reconstruction, you learn something new about from the, the documentary and archaeological evidence you already had. So it's a sort of two-way street, really. It allows you as archaeologists, us as archaeologists, to go back and re-examine stuff. And one thing, and this is just a very minor example, but I thought I'd end with a nice sort of gory story, is this was a little bit of historical information we have about the friary. Just one instance in its 300 years of history. So March 1327, we have this story surviving in the Leicester coroner's rolls from the time. John de Bushby of Leicester put himself in the church of the Friars Minor of Leicester on Saturday next after the Feast of St. Benedict in the first year of the reign of King Edward III. And on the Monday following, before Peter de Kent, the coroner, he confessed that he had killed Ralph Cockenbread of Leicester, and he stayed in that church for five weeks, and afterwards he escaped. Now, unfortunately for Ralph Cockenbread, this is the second time he appears in the coroner's rolls, which is quite impressive, but he'd already survived a murderous assault a few years earlier than this. <laughs> so what a, I don't want to read too much into it, but he seems to be unpopular at any rate. So, so. So, okay, so a little story, useful little story, just gives us a sense of what the church is being used for. It doesn't really give us too much in terms of help reconstructing the church or anything like that. But the story carries on. Walter de Bushby 
of Leicester, put himself in the church of St. Martin's of Leicester on the day and in the year aforesaid, and on Wednesday following, before the coroner, he confessed that he had received John, his brother, a felon of the king, knowing him to have killed Ralph Cockenbread. And afterwards, on Saturday, the feast of St. Mark of the Evangelist, next following, in the presence of the coroner and bailiffs, he gave himself back to peace and was delivered by the coroner to Robert Clark, bailiff, for safe and secure keeping, from whose custody he escaped. <laughs> So from about this, all we're learning is that the Bushbees are pretty slippery as brothers. So it's a, um, but what is interesting here, we've got, we've got two people related to each other um, claiming sanctuary in two churches in Leicester for the same event, effectively. One for the murder and one for harboring the murder, but the same cause. Um, one has fled to the Friary Church, the other has fled to St. Martin's Church. Now, we now understand that's because they're both next to each other. But in the whole city that is full of churches, why have these brothers chosen those two particular churches? Well, if we go back to that reconstruction and start using it to sort of understand the landscape around the Friary, so we've got John de Bushby in the Friary Church, Walter in St. Martin's, where well, it starts suddenly becoming a lot clearer when we start combining this with the borough records and realize that this house is Walter de Bushby's house. He is living on the corner of what was the High Street and St. Francis's Lane. So he's got that, he owns this, this block of land here. It also then perhaps becomes clear why John de Bushby was able to escape and why his brother ended up in trouble. Because it seems logical, therefore, as his brother's backyard's back wall was the friary wall, that his brothers just jumped the wall and got into his brother's house. And then he's just nipped out the south gate before anyone's actually realised he's left the friary. I don't know. That might be reading too much into it, but it's a possible solution. There's also another thing. We've always wondered here. So there, we know from 1349 that there is a donation to the friary by a Gilbert and Ellen Lavener of a block of land so for them to expand their friary into. And we're pretty sure it's this block of land here. It later became called St. Francis's Garden and passed to Wigston's Hospital after the dissolution. And, but why was it that block of land that was given to the friary? Why, what is the significance here? And we now know through this, and it's really only it was looking at this reconstruction and then sort of realizing it with the story and going back to the borough records. We now know Ellen Lavener was Walter de Bushby's daughter. So she and her husband have given a bit of that family block of land to the friary. So suddenly it's again made connection with that other bit of evidence as well. We don't know what happened to Walter. He seems to disappear from the records. Um, I'm sort of starting to think he might have been the mafia kingpin of Leicester in the medieval period. But he also seems to have been mayor of Leicester, bailiff for Leicester, and various other roles as well. So again, mafia kingpin, I feel. But, um, John de Bushby, though, gets pardoned. August the 7th, 1327. Pardoned for John de Bushby of Leicester for the death of Ralph Cockenbread on the condition of good service against the Scots. So it's a coronation day pardon, basically, um, during Edward III's coronation. So he's one of a group. And we don't know if it is him or not, but we do find a reference in 1355 to a John de Bushby, a sergeant of the mayor in Leicester as well. Whether it's the same John, we don't know. But anyway, it just adds a little story to the friary, because up to this point, we're just talking about buildings. We don't actually, through our excavations, have much insights into the friars that lived here, because we haven't excavated their areas. What we do have, though, is stories that we can now, through the reconstruction, start populating the friary and make, bringing it back to life in a bit more detail. And that's really important, because whilst we've got this reconstruction now, what this is really helping us also do is appreciate the space and the cityscape we've lost. And it really does stand out as stark how different the, cha cha the, the town has changed when you start creating images like this with the reconstructions. Especially when, when you walk around the site today, there's absolutely nothing visible above ground anymore. So thank you.